This is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. And today, my co host, Frank Santo Padre, and I speak to pop culture author and expert Steve Cox. He's written books about Johnny Carson, Abbott and Costello, the Three Stooges, the Beverly Hillbillies, Gilligan's Island, and the Wizard of Oz and many, many more. Steve shares fascinating and obscure stories about Hollywood legends, some that may be true and some that I pray aren't true. Listen and decide for yourself if you dare. Steve Cox. Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried with my co-host Frank Santo Padre on Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast. Now, this next guy you might not know by name, but he's written here on Gilligan's Island, The Munchkins of Oz, Cooking with Oz, Dreaming of Genies, TV's Primetime in a Bottle, It's a Wonderful Life, one fine stooge about Larry Fine, The Munsters A Trip Down Mockingbird Lane, Short and Sweet, The Life of the Lollipop Munchkin with <laughs> Jerry Marin and the incredible Mr. Don Knotts. So please welcome Steve Cox. Hey guys, it's it's good to be with you. Thanks for doing it, Steve. So let's sure. start. I'm I'm obsessed with the Stooges too. Oh, are you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love the Stooges. I, I yeah. grew up watching them. Yeah, well, you know, well, yeah, but you guys had, uh, who was it, uh, Officer Joe Bolton I, introducing yeah, us? I grew up yeah, in Officer Brooklyn. Joe. Officer Joe Bolton, yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't know his show, but I called him because he was, I think he was mentioned in Mo Howard's book, you know? And he was this old guy that, that uh, it was really nice to fans. He was listed in the phone book. And uh, <laughs> did you ever talk to him? Did you ever meet him? No, I never met him. Yeah, well, yeah, every city had one of these old guys, and they were mostly guys too, that would be on these these uh, these these kitty shows, you know. In St. Louis, um, it was before my time, but we had Harry Fender, who uh, was an old Broadway actor. And he played Captain Eleven, and he was like a showboat, like a riverboat captain, you know, and he looked like Mark Twain. That's what we had. You guys had Officer Joe Bolton, and every city had one of these Jack guys McCarthy. that would introduce yes. the Stooges. He, Captain Jack McCarthy uh, used to show the Popeye right. cartoons. Three, three bells and all as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? Because everybody grew up with that stuff. And, and, and Chuck McCann. Chuck McCann, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's still alive. <laughs> so, so and, and you, people you, loved him. You used to visit Larry Fine. No, 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 no. I, you know what? I was just sort of on the cusp there. I remember as a kid hearing when Mo died, and I was I was just devastated by this. Uh, and so I kind of missed, you know, corresponding or, or talking with Mo and, and Larry. I did get to know Joe Dorita pretty well. Uh, and also Joe Besser. And um, as a matter of fact, when Joe Dorita died, I'm very proud of this. I now was let's, his... let's for people who don't know, Joe Curly Joe Dorita was the very last of the Third Stooge. Exactly right, right. And uh, when I knew him, he was uh, he was just miserably obese, a very very large guy. Uh, and, you know, he would have fans over every once in a while if he called him and got hold of his phone number, and he'd be sitting there in his house. I remember visiting him with my dad. I went out to Hollywood for a little father-son trip, that type of thing. I was 13, I think. I went out to his house and uh, visited him. The second time I went out there, he was comfortable with me and that, and he showed up at the door in his underwear, in his underwear, just his boxers, <laughs> and... <laughs> That's something and, I don't want to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and like a wife, be a wife beater, huge. You know, he could barely walk. <laughs> and 
he would sit in this chair with, you know, this giant groin, you know, that sort of hung over. Oh. And, <laughs> that that and old I, man. I, I, oh. I, <laughs> he would smoke his little cigars, you know, and I said to him, I said, Joe, uh, you know, I, I kind of want to take a picture of you, but, you know, you're in your underwear. He said, well, what's the matter with my underwear? It's clean. <laughs> so I took, <laughs> I took some pictures. <laughs> and... Uh, so, you know, stuff like that. But Joe was a great guy. And when he died, um, I slipped a cigar into his, into his lapel. I asked his wife, I said, could I do this? Send Joe off with a cigar. And she said, oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be lovely. You know, and, she, and uh, Joe was a good guy. He, and he had a really good sense of humor. And uh, Joe Besser, who was not that popular as, you know, one of the Stooges, uh, but more popular, I think, with Abbott and Costello. I mean, don't you guys agree with that? Yeah, it's stinky. Oh, yeah. Yes, Besser. Besser Absolutely. Any day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really funny, instinctive comedian. And, 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 and my God, Gilbert, you know, I mean, he, he, I, I, in a way, I compare him to you because his act was that unique. You know what I mean? This, this and is everybody the first tried time. to do him. <laughs> This is the first time I've been compared to Joe Best <laughs> in my entire career. This, this is kind of a special moment for me. <laughs> oh, that Gilbert Gottfried, he's a young Joe Besser. <laughs> the, mo the modern day Joe Besser. <laughs> now, you told me a story when you were a kid. You wrote Joe Besser uh, a fan letter. I did, yeah. I, d I did. And I, I wanted to call him because, again, Joe Besser was listed in the phone book. There were a lot of stars back then that were listed in the phone book. Well, I think I Stan wanted, Laurel. He, he was, was yeah. I, that was before my time, too. But, uh, yeah, Stan Laurel. I remember Al Lewis was listed in the phone book. A lot of people like that, if you just kind of explored the directory a little bit. And, uh, but Besser, I wanted to call him, and my parents said, no, no, you better write him. You better write him a letter. And being from St. Louis, which is where he was from, I wrote him this great fan letter and, and that. And one night, uh, I was watching TV with my parents. I remember the phone rings. It was like a Friday night, about uh, 8 o'clock. And uh, he, he says, Steve, do you know who this is? I said, I, I, I don't know. This is Joe Besser. And I, I, I just flipped. I couldn't believe it. And I remember asking him, you know, can I ask you a few questions? And, of course, I asked him about working with the Stooges. And then I said, can, would you do one of your catchphrases? Would you, would you, you know, what? Would you, would you do one of your catchphrases? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Would you do one of your catch? Not so loud, you know. <laughs> and so, he had, oh, that's so it was great because he had set me up, you know. I, it, that, was, uh, that was a great memory. And we became friends and, and – uh, uh, he he was a nice guy. I think he really didn't like the fact that so many people asked him about the Stooges. You know, he worked with everybody else, and he used to whine a lot. Oh my God, I've done so much more Jack Benny and the, you know Jerry Lewis and all that stuff. But he was a good guy, you know. But he really wouldn't like when you spent time with him. He wouldn't do the you know not so loud or you had to ask him to do it. You had to almost beg him to do that stuff. Oh, and you I know? and be before I forget. Now, Frank, you were at uh, Curly Joe Dorita's wake. I was, you, and I oh, bet Steve oh, was Frank, there you, too. You were there? You know, Steve, it's a weird story. I was living in L.A., and a friend of mine, uh, Mark Newgarden, called me up, and he said, Joe Dorita died, and we're going over to the wake. <laughs> I said, what do you mean we're going? I said, you don't have a car. So he was calling me for a lift, and it was if you remember, you must have been there. I was, yeah. It, it was in North Hollywood, and that, and it was, it was not well attended as i remember oh exactly yeah. I, you know we may have met there and and i don't even remember. oh my god yeah there was like wouldn't you say there was less than 25 people there yeah i remember a row of people in the back row wearing wearing three stooges shirts oh my which god which is a little disturbing I and i, I took I the mask <laughs> card because I, I i said i had to have it i actually gave it to a, a friend a, a, a friend of mine tom leopold a comedy writer and he wanted it desperately so i gave him the mask card as a gift but it was very oh surreal God. and, uh, you know, a little sad. Now, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I <laughs> heard that uh, of all people, Drac son of Dracula, Beta Lugosi Jr., uh, is the one who got, um, he was fighting to get money uh, for people whose 
parents' images were being used. And I heard he was fighting for the Stooges, uh, or at least their children. And is it true that most of the Three Stooges' fortune went to Curly Joe Dorita's descendants? Yeah, in a way. In, in, in a way. In that uh, the minute Joe Dorita died, his two um, stepsons, who were both lawyers, got together, and because they had seen, you know, the other families, well, essentially Moe's family, uh, uh, getting all the money from merchandising and that type of thing, not Larry's family, not, not anybody else's family, uh, Curly and Shemp's families were paid off years ago, so in the picture was any monies coming from the Stooges from the mid-60s went to Mo, Larry, and Curly Joe as a, as a team. But then when the, they started dying off, most of the money was going to Mo's family. So Curly Joe's family finally said, that's it. And the, But Joe Dorita did not want them to file suit. He didn't want to make waves. The minute he died, and I mean the minute he died, his, his two stepsons, uh, not his sons, but stepsons, filed suit against Moe's family, which essentially held all the rights and all that, and won. And so the rights and, and found Moe's family negligent, um, could have sent one of the, uh, one of the family members uh, to jail, but instead uh, gave them the option that either relinquish your rights your voting right to the Stooges to us. So right now, as it stands, the company that Moller and Curly Joe started, which was called Comedy Three, still exists. Only now, uh, Larry's family and Curly Joe's family pretty much control it with two thirds of the rights. And Moe's fa Mo's family also shares in the money, but they don't have voting rights. They, you know, control over the company. So essentially, and, and then Curly Joe's family pretty much runs it. So, yeah, the, 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 what, the monies that come in from the movies and all that stuff, that's all controlled essentially by Curly Joe's family. And that's where it stands. So, uh, yeah, it's I, unusual, isn't it? Yeah. It's very unusual, especially since when I was a kid, Watching it, I used to go, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> he's fat, yeah. he's bald. He's not uh, curly. No, yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> you no, know, it was like, I remember going, hey, buddy boy. And that was about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. He, he, and almost, almost kind of mean looking. He had, he was, you know, he was kind of mean, and certainly not as graceful as Curly. You know, he was heavy, but he was more obese heavy. Yeah, Curly uh, was lovable and <laughs> vulnerable. It, I Curly Joe Dorita to me always looked like uh, uh, when they had a cast. Mo and Larry uh, looked out in the street. And this fat guy was walking by and goes, hey, would you shave your head? <laughs> okay, you're hired. <laughs> right. You want to be <laughs> it's, it's true. And, but you know what? In real life, though, if you got him alone, he, he didn't think, he, he would say this, he didn't never thought that the Stooges were that funny. But he did have a good, <laughs> <laughs> he did have a good uh, vaudeville sense about him and would really be funny with observations and things like that and had a good sense of humor. I remember this, too. I was sitting there with my dad with him, and um, Joe was trying to tell my dad, he was trying to pay a compliment in that he, 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 he looked at my dad and he says, Steve, he, he's pushy. And I, my, my dad goes, what? And he goes, he's pushy. And, and then I think my dad figured out he meant pushy, not pussy. Oh. <laughs> pushy, m meaning, you know, tenacious. And uh, my dad, I just remember my dad looking at him like, what the hell? But, uh, yeah, Joe was a good guy. He was a good guy, just not that popular. And then he ended up being the last stooge. And his, um, now I'm not saying this to toot my horn, but I'm, I'm only saying it because it's true. When he died there, um, you know, uh, uh, he, did, he didn't have much money. I mean, he, that's one of the reasons they sued. I mean, he just wasn't getting any money from the Stooges Corporation at all. And uh, his stepsons were essentially supporting Joe and that. 
uh, and they filed that suit. But his wife claimed that they didn't have money to uh, to even uh, acquire the headstone. So one of the munchkins from the wood. Now this is true. Yeah. One of the munchkins from the. <laughs> <That's a segue. laughs> I know this it sounds more bizarre, more but more surreal. <laughs> I know. <laughs> one it was of the munchkins. Bad he was bad enough imagining Curly Joe Dorita in his underwear. Well, then he compared you to Joe Best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, this is true, though. One of the munchkins from The Wizard of Oz uh, who lived in St. Louis, and, and I grew up with him. That's how I got to, into midgets. Uh, he, he, well, he, we, I don't friend, know if you should admit to that on the air. <laughs> well, I think there's only, a law against Yeah, mild them. fascination, yeah. mild. But uh, he, this guy, Mickey Carroll, who was, he was a midget and he worked in the Wizard of Oz. He, his family business, after he quit show business, was uh, making headstones. And so I told him about this. He said, look, I'll make the headstone. You guys pay for the installation. And me and a few fans, we put the money together uh, and, and gave it to Mickey. He had this, this black marble headstone made with Joe's face on it and did it with, um, it was like an etching of his face and, and did it with uh, Jean Dorita, Joe's wife. And uh, they won it on there, the last stooge, and, and uh, that was that was his gravestone. And, that, and a lot of fans visit that gravestone too. It's, it's kind of unusual, but uh, he was the last stooge, the last stooge. Now, did you know Vernon Dent? Uh, yeah, I think he's great. He was great. Yeah, was Vernon the, Dent yeah. was. He always played like gangsters in the Stooges movies. He was a big guy, big husky guy, tough guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for, absolutely. For yeah. So what do you know about Vernon Dent? I, you know what I know about, well, of course, what, what, uh, what Stooges fans see of him, uh, which is, you know, in almost every other curly short and, and champ. But one time I got hold of his wife on the phone. Her name was, I think, Eunice, Eunice Dent. And this was, you know, long after he had died. And I was so surprised. I couldn't believe she was still alive. And she... She told me all about him. I, I just couldn't get enough asking about him, how, how his hair was snow white when he, when he got old. He went blind, and uh, he was pretty heavy, still heavy said He was diabetic. That's why he went blind. And he didn't take control of his diabetes, so uh, it progressed like that. Uh, and he, she, he, I remember she said that he was also a dog lover and that Curly gave them a little dog he had found somewhere on the road, brought it home, and gave it to Eunice and Vernon. I thought that was a kind of an interesting detail. Like Curly used to collect dogs that he'd find, stray dogs. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's what his... I, I knew one of his wives pretty well, uh, and uh, El Elaine, his second wife, and she said that he would pick them up everywhere. I mean, they had several dogs, but he really, really loved playing with dogs, and just and all types of dogs, uh, not just one type or anything. Um, and uh, you know, always had to have a backyard wherever he lived, with plenty of space for the dogs. And and then would eventually find dogs out on the road, you know, and bring them in on the train trips and that, you know. And um, but then he would have to sort of get rid of them, which was would would be like a heartache because he had enough at home. But uh, yeah, I'm working right no. now. I'm working on a book on Curly, and just to, uh, uh, I think it's going to be an amazing book, and with a lot of rare color photography that nobody's ever seen. Now, did did our Curly mutual friend Howard. Drew Friedman do something for the Curly book? He Steve? has promised me, and I am going to hold him to it. Okay. Yes, that's what yes. we heard. <laughs> and he, Absolutely. He told me that that uh, that Larry Fine was something of a lady killer, Stephen. I is this I've true? So I have a hard time I, wrapping my mind around it. Yeah, I know. It is kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, here's a story that I heard and unfortunately did not make it into my book on Larry, One Fine Stooge. But this is true. Um, a good friend of Larry's told me this, that when Larry was out on the road, and his wife got, she got wind of you know him fooling around and messing around while out on the road. <laughs> Thought of it. <laughs> so there so she got pissed at him and said, Okay, this is what we're gonna plan here. When Larry would call home 
or if she would call him, let's say, in Kansas City at 1030 at night just to make sure he's doing okay in that, the signal was he, she said, okay, say it, say it. And Larry would have to say into the phone, I'm laying here with a dirty, rotten whore. <laughs> God. So it was, you know, so to, to either embarrass the whore that he was with, you know, or not, uh, if he was alone. So he would have to say that. She would say, say it, say it. And he'd have to say that. Now, so, uh, yeah, I guess Larry did get around a little bit. And Larry's wife, though, went a little nutty, didn't she? Wasn't she an alcoholic? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, aren't we all? But she, <laughs> she, she no, got. I she, <laughs> <laughs> she got. She would be violent. She, uh, you know, she would throw things at him and 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 like uh, ceramic ashtrays and you know. Uh, she got, and she, I guess, just the filthiest mouth on her, um, and, uh, would get really, really drunk and then send Larry out for Chinese food at three in the morning, you know. <laughs> now, did Mo visit Vernon Dent toward the end of his life? I heard he used to visit him a lot. I don't know. I really don't know. And, you know, those are questions that I, gosh, if, if I had known Mo, I would have really gotten in there and started asking questions. You know, I, I want to know if he ever met Chaplin. I want to know if he ever, uh, you know, did he interact with, you know, other great comedians and that, uh, that type of thing. And there's some fans that would, would get in there and, and meet with Mo and ask certain questions, but, you know, damn, I wish I could have gotten in there to really, and, and same with Larry, you know, and that, you know, where were they when Kennedy was shot? Where, the, you know, there's a lot of questions. Do you, do you suspect uh, yeah. one of them? Is, is it being <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you know what I mean. Your Larry it's just all is the... impeccable, by the way. It's Billy, it's Billy Westgood, I dare say. <laughs> oh, now, now, you're uh, getting back to the Wizard of Oz, what about that great story of that if you watch The Wizard of Oz, uh, one of the, the uh, munchkins <laughs> yeah, hung himself, yeah. and you could see him hanging in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, it's, uh, yeah, that story didn't start till like, around the 80s, you know? And, and, I, and I, it'd be, I'd love to know who just really was the root source of that thing. I'd love for uh, it to be true. It's so it's, good. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's nice to look around, but, you know, it never happened. I mean, lot, lots of weird stuff happened on that set, but uh, not bad, I don't yeah, think. Frank and I were talking that, Judy Garland started the rumor that the all yeah. all of the munchkins <laughs> on the Jack Parr show, right? Yeah, right, Stephen. That yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in in the last twenty five years, I had to watch these these midgets go on appearances. And every time, <laughs> they're. <laughs> you know, that's and every that's time not they the correct up, term. It's munchkin. <laughs> it's munchkin. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's right. You see. I, a small person call them a munchkin. Munchkin. Yes. <laughs> oh God, I, I That's can't tell the you how many times. politically correct term. Well, it's true. And the dwarves. Oh my God, they really get after me for calling. <laughs> you know, referring to the midgets as midgets. But the thing of it is, all the midgets are gone. You see what I'm saying? So <laughs> it's the dwarves that want to wipe away the term midget. Because all the but the midgets never minded being called midgets. What about fidgets? That's what's so weird about it. Rascal, homage. Yeah. You know. But but wait wait. So uh, is there is there like a war between midgets and dwarves? Yes, there is. Yeah. I, I mean, let's just put it out there. That, yeah. You know, there is because and and midgets. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true because the the midgets were proportionally correct. You know what yes. I mean, and 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 got a lot of roles because that's what the studio wanted. <laughs> you know, and, so, and the dwarves would get pissed at the midgets. So, so and uh, dwarves. Oh yeah, dwarves <laughs> were like deformed midgets. <laughs> they're, I, it, that's that's a way to put it. You know, they're they're <laughs> they're proportionally incorrect. So the midgets 
are like you and I, only miniature. That's the way that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the way to figure it, you know. Or I try to tell people dwarfs are the Oompa Loompas. The midgets <laughs> are the munchkins. They love that, too. That's, a, that's how you can they tell, you know. How, how many months hey, I heard that that beetle said, juice is not happy like with you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I heard that beetle juice is not happy with you. Oh. <laughs> I, I heard that through the midget grapevine. <laughs> I don't know what you did to him, but he's not happy. <laughs> Uh, now, now, what category would Beetlejuice be in? I think he's a midget. I, what I've seen, I think he's a midget. <laughs> yeah. Now, now be, we'll get back to the Wizard of Oz, but I forget his name now. Uh, Dr. Loveless from Wild Wild West. Oh, Michael. Oh, yeah. Michael Dunn. Yeah. Michael Dunn. Michael, Michael Dunn. Dunn, yeah. yeah. Very good. What do you know about Michael <laughs> Yeah. No, he's a dwarf. I <laughs> dwarf. I don't know much about him. I mean, he died young, you know. But I heard he was a nice guy. I heard he was a nice guy. <laughs> oh, and he was in Chip of Fools. Oh yeah, he did a lot of films. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. good little actor, so you, absolutely. So you worked yeah. with the Munchkins on 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 a book, Stephen, and they were not drunks. As you you want to you want to dispel that myth. It's true. It, it, it's true. I mean, yeah. You know, Judy Garland, she goes on this show, okay, and she is, you know, half-crocked herself, and she says, well, they were, they were all drunks, they were two inches tall, they asked her out on dates and stuff like that. And, you know, she's trying to be funny and all that. But then over the years, that developed into this huge uh, myth and urban legend and all that stuff. And so I felt bad because... I know that the Munchkins entrusted me in my book to make sure to try to straighten the story, but no matter where they went, everybody asked them that question. So, you know, they were embarrassed, and I, I in a way, I blame that on Judy Garland, really, for pe perpetuating that, putting that out there, and making those little people suffer uh, with having to answer those stupid questions. You know what I mean? Were you drunks? Where, was everybody drunk? Were there orgies and stuff like that? And so we used to make fun, you know, like Margaret Pellegrini, one of the very uh, 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 more uh, prominent little people that that went on uh, tours and stuff like that uh, and was one of the munchkins. I would joke with her and say, well, you weren't invited to the parties, you know, and and, and we'd make a joke out of it. But they were really embarrassed by it. You know, uh, most most all of them were embarrassed. There were a few that were drunks, and there were <laughs> one of them showed up on the set with a gun, wow. and uh, you know they had to um, get that taken care of quickly. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you know Did they have the, handcuffs small enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you know some of those people were so small. I mean, they had to help help them on the toilets, literally, because they would fall in. They were that small. And uh, they had to help them with their costumes and, 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 you know, help them go to the bathroom. And they had special tables for their lunches and stuff like that, really, you know, low. Because these, the midgets were the ones that we saw in the past 25 years that attended festivals and things like that. Now, they, they, they all grew, you know, they grew after The Wizard of Oz. Now, they all lived, I, it seems like most of them lived to a ripe old age. Right, which is another difference between dwarfs and midgets. You rarely ever, you rarely ever see an old dwarf. <laughs> I've never so, looked for I'm not making this up. You know, I'm, just, I'm not making this up. And but you will see old midgets. They they they're just like us. They live, you know. And right now, there's only one munchkin left. Uh, Jerry Marin, oh, Jerry who Marin. was the lollipop munchkin. He's 94, and he's the last one. The last, the last one. Ruth, and Ruth I always passed, I, right? She was the last. She was the last female munchkin. Uh, Ruth Dusin. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, they both did a little bit of publicity last year for Warner Brothers. Uh, you know, 50th. Uh, excuse me, 75th anniversary stuff, which was a year before. The actual anniversary is in about four weeks. That's exactly to the date. 
75 years after it premiered at Grauman's. But they did something uh, last year for the promotion of the new box set and all that, and um, they couldn't get the two munchkins together. Jerry lived here in L.A., Ruth came in from Vegas, and it was really nostalgic because uh, they were doing separate sort of promos different days, but Ruth said, uh, she told me, Steve, I want to see Jerry one last time, and I privately, I took her over to where Jerry was staying, and they got together and had a visit, and that was the last time the two Munchkins got together, and it was really, really sad in a way, because uh, they were about to leave, and, and, you know, Jerry gives her a hug and says, I don't want to be the last one, you know, wow. and it was it was very warm, and, and my God, I almost started crying, but they hugged, and they knew that would be the last time they'd see each other, and Ruth died not long after that, and Jerry was the last one. And I, I went over to where he's living, and I said, Jerry, you're the last one. And he said, oh, she died, huh? And I said, yeah, that's, you're the one. So, and it was weird, because when I, when I researched the Munchkins years ago in the 80s, there was 33 of them still alive, and I always wondered right then, who's going to be the last one? Oh, and wow. You know, but it, to me, it's it's kind of exciting that the last one is the most beloved Munchkin of them all. If you ever see somebody do a parody of the Munchkins, who do they do? The Lollipop Munchkin. You know what I mean? So now, he's is, the it, is it true that Toto, the little dog Toto, was paid more than the Munchkins were? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> they didn't know it at the time, but yeah, that's true. <laughs> Jer yeah. Jerry Marin was in a lot of other things, wasn't he, Stephen? I'm, 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 I seem to remember him from an Odd Couple episode. Yeah, that. In fact, Frank, that is one of his most. Uh, that's one of the proudest things he's done in his career. Yeah, because he was there's funny. A lot of lines. Yeah, and he played like a little um, a racing. Um, what do you call it? Yeah, he was yeah. a jockey who was giving Oscar and Felix tips tips on the horses. His name was Harry Ex Tallman. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> exactly. And he he'd be in this trench coat and he'd like you know meet him at odd places and stuff. But he loved that role. He loved that role. And yeah, he did oh tons of stuff. He worked with the Marx Brothers. I think is he in at the, the circus? last at the circus? Right. Yeah. 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 He worked a and lot. Tons of movies and films. You know where he made his money? Because Jerry is a millionaire many times over. Really? And, you, and, and so, yeah, you know where he made all his money? He, he did McDonald's commercials uh, in the late 60s uh, for about 10 years, and he played Mayor McCheese and Hamburglar, sometimes uh, the, um, uh, the uh, oh, what was the it? The Grimace? The, the, uh, no, not Grimace. Uh, the one, the, well, the Hamburglar. Hamburglar. The hamburglar. Say Robble, Robble, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. And so, you know, you remember, y you guys saw the same thing as me every Saturday mornings. Sure. Those commercials were all over the place. And they did those things for 10 years. And holy mackerel, the money that he made on those was unbelievable. And that's that. Yeah, now, that and investments in right. Hollywood. Now, tell yeah. us, tell us stuff about the Munsters. You wrote a book about the Munsters. And we had Butch Patrick yeah. on the other day. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. He's great. He's great. Yeah. Butch, the first time I met him, uh, I meet him at a... He and Al Lewis were doing a, uh, an appearance at a circus in Indiana. And I drive up there and, you know... And I, the Butch, I, he won't remember this, but the first time I meet him, he's, he, he, I come into his hotel room and he lights up a joint. <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, yeah. little, little Eddie Munster uh, yeah. lit up a joint. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't so bad. Wasn't so bad. I didn't care, but he, it, number one, he didn't offer me any. And number two, <laughs> so he was stingy with it. But I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm here, you know, as a writer. I could write about this if I wanted. I didn't, you know, but I, I thought, it, you know, yeah, my God, he's pretty trusting, you know, but I didn't write about that. Um, and he's he's kind of sober now these days, I know. But um, I, that, the Monsters is one of my favorite books. Um, the only regret was was Fred Gwynn. I mean, I I tried desperately to contact him, which I did, and he turned me down for an interview. I did talk with him, um, but it, it, it was kind of mean in a way, you know. 
his agent, his publicist, everybody kept giving me no, no, no. He doesn't want to talk about the monsters. But I thought if I if I'm going to get rejected, I want to be rejected by him. So finally, I hunted him down, on and got him on the phone, and I told him what I was doing, and I asked him for an interview, and he said, no, I just, no, no, I, I don't think so. And, f- and I mean, I tried every way to practically beg him, and finally, it got down to, you know, didn't, when you were starting out in your career, didn't anybody ever give you a break? And he said, mm, no. <laughs> and that was it, you know? <laughs> he just tells me no. And, and, and so he, he just didn't, but at the end of the conversation, well, and then he, he asked me, did, you know, where I got his number, and I explained to him that I hunted it down because he was listed under his girlfriend's number at that time, and they were living together on Bleecker Street uh, uh, in the village over there. And um, he said, oh, you should have been a private investigator instead of a writer, you know. And, uh, he, you know, he's somewhat kind, but he just didn't want to talk about the monsters. Now, I found out later that he had a, a son that died, in, that drowned in their pool during the Munsters' production. And so I'm thinking, later on, I'm thinking, you know, he must have thought I, I knew it and that I would be getting into that topic, which I wouldn't have. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I would have been asking the more... Uh, uh, or, or the, 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 the common questions about the makeup and the production and all that stuff. But maybe he just didn't want to go there because of that. So I, I had never heard this story. Nor, nor me. I haven't heard it either. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he and, had a son who died in the... So the Munsters had a swimming pool on their show. That's, yeah. And, and it, well, his private, you know, his private pool. And he, yeah, his son um, fell, it was drowned in the pool. I'm not exactly sure of the exact circumstances, but it was during the production of the Munsters. And so, of course, he was devastated by this. And the other cast members knew it. And so when I found out, I think Butch is the one that told me about it, as a matter of fact. And so I didn't really get into that in the book. I don't remember what the... I revised the book later, and I'm, I think maybe I did mention it in that. Fred was dead by that time. Um, and there were also rumors about uh, an affair between Beverly Owen and Fred during, you know, she did the first 13 episodes as Marilyn, and uh, they lived together. Uh, they were friends in New York. She came out to L.A. at the same time. She would babysit his kids, that type of thing. And there were rumors that they had an affair. <laughs> Uh, and that that's one of the reasons she also left. So that's, you know, well, the official story. Are... I'm sorry, Stephen. The official story they always give is that she was going back to her boyfriend that she couldn't stand to be apart from. Right. That's the official story. Yeah. I see. <laughs> so there you go. But, um, you know, what are you going to say? But, you know, they remain friends. Beverly and Fred Gwynn remained friends all the way to the end. And um, uh, I spoke with her about the Munsters, and she she seemed to say that she was very heartbroken, just didn't want to be in L.A. and, and wanted to leave and, and asked to, to get out of there, and she did. So, uh, but, you know, I tell you, though, the best interview all the way through, and the guy that was the most encouraging to me was Al Lewis. Uh, I, 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 uh, I dedicated uh, the book to him uh, and, and my grandparents because he was my favorite character. Over and above uh, Fred, uh, you know, everybody has their favorite monster, but mine was Al Lewis, and he always treated me so well and encouraged me. I remember I, when I graduated from high school, he says, you've got to go to college. You get yourself in college. You've got to do it. You, you, that's the only way you can make a success for yourself, and that type of thing. You know, he was a great, great guy. Yeah. Now, um, he, they, they were friends, Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis, I heard. They were. And they had yeah. a falling out somewhere along the way. That's what I heard. Yeah, uh, I'm not exactly sure really what it was, but it was right around that time. You know, I mean, they were still friendly when Al opened his restaurant there in the village. Um, but I don't know exactly what else happened. Uh, I, I don't think Al even quite knew what it was. He wanted to be friends with Fred, but I think Fred's wife sort of pulled him away from the whole monster stuff and got him away from that, trying to do some more serious acting and things like that, or anything. And so, even though they were friends with Beverly Owen, um, he pulled away from Al, you know, and Al didn't quite understand it. 
you know. Um, but yeah, they they were good friends. I mean, the best of friends at one time. Because they, but you know how it is, you know. Yeah, they met on I guess on Car Fifty Four. Yeah. Yeah, and a great exactly. comedy team. They were just they were they, they just their timing was terrific. They were a great pair. Yeah, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, they, they really were. I mean, we talked about it with Butch. What do you know about Abbott and Costello? I well, I mean, my memory's kind of faded a little bit. But years ago, um, uh, another writer and I, John Laughlin, we put together a book called The Abbott and Costello Scrapbook, and I'm proud to say I think it's one of the better books on their career and. Uh, you know, we just got to, you know, after interviewing a lot of people that were still alive back then, you know, Sheldon Leonard and family members and 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 even Bud, Bud Abbott's sister and things like that, it, it, it was such a sad story, you know? I mean, how they lost all their money and just they gambled it all away and the IRS just, you know, ate them alive. It, it was just so sad and Lou was sad and Bud was sad. I mean, they were both like really warm fathers and and love their families and provided for their families but then how it split up and and um you know you know what's interesting is ken barry you know from f troop yes uh and that he was in the show that the last show that they did in vegas so this is in the late 50s just before they broke up well right when they broke up and he was one of the dancers in the show and i interviewed him about this you know and he said that, you know, Bud drank a lot at that point, and that's why Lou got pissed and said, that's it. And one of the knights just said, that's it, I'm not working again, and they parted ways, and that was it. Uh, and, um, I, you know, the ending was just so sad. Uh, it's weird. But I, I, it's kind of funny. I, I found Abbott and Costello sort of in reverse. I didn't watch the movies. I watched the cartoon shows from Hanna-Barbera and then went backwards. You know what I mean? Oh, the Stu Irwin. So, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Gilbert, yeah, and, so, I, Gilbert and I talk about the uh, the awful Bud and Lou movie, Stephen, with oh, Bud, Buddy Hackett and Harvey Korman. Yeah, it, <laughs> oh my my, my old time, <laughs> actually, actually, this is my favorite. It's my old time favorite death scene. Buddy Hackett, as the dying Lou Costello, is there, and Artie Johnson, as his agent, comes in. I think his agent's name was Irving. Eddie Sherman. Eddie, Eddie. And and he sneaks in a strawberry malted, (laughs) and Buddy Hackett goes, you know, I... I had a lot of strawberry mortgage in my day, but this one's the best. And then he dies. <laughs> that <sad>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that great? I know, what a death scene. It's a painful, what a death it's a painful scene. movie because you're watching them do who's on first. It's like they've never watched it before. <laughs> It's true. It was so slow. It, it, it was, was so like slow. they handed them the script right then, and they said, action. And they go, oh, just uh, do this? Like, you'd think they had n- they had no idea who Abbott and Costello were. Oh, it's true. I think the casting on that was, in, on theory, in pa- on paper, was great. <laughs> well, Corman was these guys together. Oh, yeah, but Buddy Hackett love... was too busy being Buddy Hackett to be anybody else. And, and I, I remember yeah. Buddy Hackett and that. It's like rather than what's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? You know, that quick patter, that musical way about it. It was like, what's the guy's name on first base? <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's so bad. It really is. It's one of our favorite bad biopics. <laughs> it really, it really is. And you know, there's some. Guy, a buddy and I just watched the Martin and Lewis one. I liked it. Oh, it was Sean really Hayes. good. You know, huh? With Sean Hayes. Right. Yeah. What, did you guys like it? I liked oh, it. Yeah, oh yeah, I enjoyed it. it. Sean Hayes now has the distinction of playing Jerry Lewis and Larry Fine. That's, That's true. true. <laughs> <laughs> that amazing. Who, who, in your that opinion, amazing? Stephen, was, who, in your opinion, was responsible for the, the surreal quality of the Abbott and Costello series? Because I talk about it with, with Drew all the time. Gilbert and I have, have, have talked about it much more so than the movies. 
It's dreamlike. Yes. There's something. Yeah. It's uh, it's almost Dada. You know, it's, it's very, very strange. And I know Larry David and, and Jerry Seinfeld were heavily influenced by it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the success is all due to Bingo the Chimp. I mean, come on. <laughs> But I mean, now, now tell no us about Sid Fields. Was, was Sid Fields one of the people behind? Because Drew says that Sid Fields had a lot to do with the the, uh, the tone of that show and the. Uh, yes, that's the what I was told. It. That's what I was told, and uh, I know uh, Jim Mulholland, uh, who's a, a great writer, was Carson and mm -hmm. Letterman's uh, monologue writer. He interviewed Sid Fields, I know, and uh, uh, got a lot of details out of him. Um, and I, yeah, I think so. And Bud and Lou were just, I think at that point in their career, were interested in not so much memorizing lines or new routines, but how can we work in the old routines? And so I think that they put uh, on the shoulders of Sid Fields a lot of that to, to just come up with stuff and let's tie these shows together because they're so loose. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing to them. Well, personally... I I, I like Hillary Brooke. I thought she was great, and 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 of course Besser. I I watch mm -hmm. for his scenes, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so bizarre. Well, I, there was one Seinfeld episode where I guess uh, Kramer and Newman are arguing about something, and Seinfeld goes, "Boys, boys." Yeah. Oh, he does yeah. a Sid Field stink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What well, wasn't wasn't the Newman character basically created to be stinky? You know, you know the, the, I never thought about that, but I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the antagonist that shows up and and he's you know and he's he's chunky and he's, you know, the like thing about the, the thing about the A and C show as a kid watching it, it just it, the, the, there was a darkness to it. There was a cruelty. Oh yes, to it. Yes, like this, you know the one where 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 Lou is trying to celebrate his birthday. Oh my God, I was just <laughs> thinking about that. <laughs> and they that him. one that one depressed me as yeah, a kid. Me too. <laughs> yeah, with Mr. Bachigaloo. Bachigaloo. <laughs> what does he come there? Remember, he makes him the cake. Oh, he, it's he so goes, awful. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is bad. There it was is. an element of cruelty. Yeah, and, and I was sadism. a kid, and I was depressed by that one. It was yeah. disturbing. And the music in the background that they put in is just so bad, also, uh, that, you know, it didn't help. Uh, but I will say this for the show, because uh, it is entertaining, but. The, 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 when they go to the old actors' home, and they do who's on first. Oh, that's yeah. that's is one of the better of the versions ever put on film of who's on first. I much prefer that than the, than that you know gay '90s riverboat one they did on at Universal. You know, oh, uh, the, yeah, much much better version. But oh uh, uh, yeah, the show, I mean the show was great, and um, Hillary Brooke, you know, to me played it so perfectly, just perfectly straight. You know, always calling him Lewis, and uh, I, you could see the influences on Seinfeld and, and, and Larry David. Now, uh, you know this. This I don't even know if we can use it, but it's something that everybody <laughs> who who knows old show biz uh, talks about. And and it's it's perfect that lightning just struck as <laughs> it's like a Frankenstein movie. I just heard thunder. Thunder is happening right as I mention this. And and There's so in sign. two words, uh, Danny Thomas. Oh God! Okay, now I <laughs> yeah. be referring to Gilbert. <laughs> that he had a popular sitcom. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, look, the, you know, I I don't know what I should tell you guys or not, but I'm going to do it, and I'm going to put this on your shoulders whether you want to use this or not. Yeah. But, you know, yes. But you know, it's strangely, it's the it's. I mean, this this is legendary, and I heard about this years and years ago. Uh, and of course, it's it's it, it, even if you Google it, uh, you know, eggs Danny Thomas style. Uh, it, it, it's it's right there. And years ago, a friend of mine told me this story, and I said, oh, my God, you can't believe it. And the story is is that Danny Thomas allegedly had sort of, uh, you know, a proclivity for um, – he, he liked a woman to shit in his mouth. Okay, and this was <laughs> – there's no other way to put it, you know. And, uh, and this was something that he liked. So, I, you know, I'm kind of thinking, okay – 
And uh, people in show business, it's you know, I mean, it's as it's as well known as as Milton Berle's schlong. So, uh, you know, and, and I, every they call it, kid knows this. It's true. And See, uh, I'd there like are to have an intellectual show. <laughs> <laughs> I pride myself on good taste <laughs> and stuff that's really subtle, and you got to think about it. Yeah. Well, it's this is the so, story. So he liked know. women to shit. <laughs> In his, mouth. in his mouth. Yeah, this was his his fetish. And, okay, now if uh, I can argue with you, sure. I I heard he liked to lie on the floor <laughs> and, <laughs> and have women shit on a glass coffee table, which uh, would have okay, been a now, lot more decent. <laughs> true. Now I alle- I heard this was allegedly attributed <laughs> attributed to Jerry Lewis. Jerry and, Lewis. Yes, that the glass table story. The glass table story had evidently nothing to do with with Danny Thomas. Now let me tell you. Now wait, this wait. Is, when the okay. girls when the girls were shitting on the coffee table over Jerry Lewis, is it true that he was going, "Yeah, hi, hi, oh, with the thing with the the doody and the bison, ah, ha, ha, yeah." <laughs> I that could very well be. I'll make the no, big brown duty on the thing <laughs> on the table where you gotta wipe off with a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, you know, I can see it. I can just see it. But that's, and I say that though, not because Jerry Lewis was an ass to me once. I have heard that attributed to him. The glass table party. <laughs> Lady, can you squeeze out a bigger duty in the thing on the table, not in the mouth like with Danny? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! Oh God! This hey, funny killer. Can you shit. can you can you take a shit on me like Dean Martin used to when we were a team? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Oh Gilbert, God! Now, now, I heard <laughs> that is great. <laughs> <laughs> People shit on me. Why do I shit on Danny Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Danny boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that amazing? Oh, yes. <laughs> you had to tell me you never heard that about Jerry Lewis? <laughs> Allegedly. (laughs) 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 Now, someone else told me that (laughs) to make it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to tell you, I got to tell you about the Danny Thomas part, though. This is. (laughs) People are thinking, I'm sure people are thinking, oh, come on, he just made this up. But. I, you know, we had a mutual friend, which was Sid Melton. Sid Melton. Yes. Sid Melton. Do you remember Sid? I, of I've course. met him a couple yes, of times. Sure. He was very right. nice Drew, guy. Drew Friedman is obsessed with him. And, and Sid, I got to know him when I was working on a, 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 a book on Green Acres. And we used to go to lunches a lot. And then he started sort of relying on me to drive him places and stuff like that and take his dog to the vet. And, you know, and I heard you had a run in with this dog and all kinds of stuff. Well, Sid, once I got real comfortable with him after a few years, you know, he always talked about Danny Thomas and he was on the Danny Thomas show. He was best friends with Danny Thomas. And so I thought, okay, I I can ask him about this. So we're at lunch one day and I said, Sid, I'm going to ask you a question about Danny Thomas. And he says, I know what you're going to ask. And I said, what, what, you do? And he goes, yeah. And this is exactly what he said. He said, uh, you mean uh, the feces as an appetizer? And I said, oh, my God. 
it sounded like a main course. <laughs> <laughs> the way I heard it. <laughs> and <laughs> on the woman. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and so Sid, like I looked at him. Like if it was Tony Fields. Yeah, or Tony <laughs> Fields. Totally different. Totally <laughs> Fields. So I said, I said to Sid, I said to Sid, oh my God, I, I, you know, I couldn't believe he said this before I, I got it out. And he, uh, he said, and oh no, yeah. that's, that's what Danny Thomas, I can't yeah. believe I said it before she got it out. Got it out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so and so I, I asked Sid, I said, are, are you serious? He says, this is exactly what he said to me. I know it to be true because I knew his mistress and she told me what he liked to do. And I said, oh, my God. I said, How, what do you think about that? And he goes, well, everybody's got their own thing. And that was it. Now, he was Danny <laughs> Thomas's best friend. So uh, that's, that's that. And I'll now, put now, my hand on the Bible. That happened. Now, is it, is it true that Danny Thomas's mistress, before the date, would go to the hamburger hamlet <laughs> and eat a couple of plates of angel hair pop. That's a callback. <laughs> oh, God. oh my God. And, and is it true that one time she was constipated and Danny Thomas cried, you don't love me anymore. <laughs> I heard her farts <laughs> made a sound of da 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 <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to move this on, Steve. <laughs> you, you, wrote a book, you wrote a book about Green Acres. And I understand you have it. I heard that Ava Gabor used to shit. <laughs> <Under the elbow>. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he had the pitchfork. <laughs> we understand you have an Ava Gabor story. <laughs> Not that one. Yeah. That Jerry Lewis yeah. used to shit on Ava Gabor. Ava uh, Gabor. <laughs> well, she. Hey, yeah. Ava! Open your mouth! <laughs> Yeah, holy boy, she was something. Here, yeah, get right. ready for a green acre. Oh, even. <laughs> oh yeah, she was. She, it, 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 it was just, just something. <laughs> oh man, she she. Oh, yeah, man. Ava Gabor. I do have a good <laughs> Ava Gabor story. She, uh, I was doing this book on Green Acres, and, and she, she, she was nice. She was really nice to me. I interviewed her at at her house in this mansion, you know, and uh, she she was great. She was great. But I, at one point when I was interviewing her. I brought over, which is what I do a lot of times. I'll bring over a stack of pictures from like that show or something. And, and uh, Ava was sitting on her couch and she's just looking through the pictures. And usually the pictures, like old publicity pictures, will spark some memories and that kind of thing. And she's sitting there and she and 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 I'm asking her questions and she's looking through the pictures and commenting on them. And she just starts making a separate pile, just you know. Just making a separate that's, pile. That's what used to happen with Danny <laughs> Thomas. They would, they would, his I know it's made a separate pile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
one for Danny and the other for Jerry. Put go, oh, you thought of me with the thing with the duty. <laughs> Oh God! I knew as soon as I, I knew as soon as I said that, I knew that you were going to say something. I should have said that. Choose your words carefully. From okay. This point on. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, I just before we wrap, I have one question. Why didn't you think of that scene in the Button Lou movie where Costello goes, "Hey, Happy, can you take a?" Crap on me. <laughs> Could you watch out a bowel movement in my mouth? <laughs> okay. We can go. Push, push, push. That's your closer. <laughs> on my podcast with that? Come on. And, and, and is it true that Lou Costello, when he was taking a dump, would force <laughs> it out by going, hey! <laughs> 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 I bet there's truth to that, Gilbert. I can see it. <laughs> oh, oh God. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking to Steve Cox. Oh. Writer of endless books on old Hollywood, and uh, Steve, will you come back and talk about "It's a Wonderful Life" next time? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah, please. Oh, Gilbert, some, <laughs> something else. Where that please. Go. <laughs> I heard uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" is what <laughs> Danny Thomas said when the girl was shitting on him. <laughs> oh Lord. Thank you. Uh, Steve, thanks for doing it. Thank you, Steve You're Cox. a trooper. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I had a great Stephen time. Stephen Cox, so call me any time. Look for his books on Amazon, folks. He's written every book imaginable. Johnny Carson, Beverly Hillbillies, Gilligan's Island. Thank you, buddy. Hey, thanks, guys. No, really, I had a great time.